Hello everyone, this is the Theoretical Doctor and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, welcome. This is a series on the chapter Gaseous Exchange of Chapter 1 of the STPM Semester 2 Biology series. Check out the full playlist on my channel. If you want to access flashcards on this topic and other videos, do click the link below. It is available on my Pinterest and slides on this topic are available on my website. In this video, we will be continuing on gaseous exchange whereby we will dive into hemoglobin and transport of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Hence, the subtopics covered will be on the structure of hemoglobin, transport of oxygen in the blood, and transport of carbon dioxide in the blood. Structure of hemoglobin. It has a quaternary structure and it is spherical globular protein as you can see in the picture over here. It does not have a nucleus and this provides the red blood cells with high high surface ratio to volume ratio for more efficient gas diffusion. Basically, it means that this gives extra space for association and dissociation of oxygen. It is a conjugated protein, meaning that it is made up of heme and globin. So the globin part, the protein consists of four polypeptide chains consisting of two alpha chains and two beta chains. The heme part each polypeptide chain is incorporated with a non-protein prostatic group called heme. And each heme group comprises of a porphyrin ring enclosing an iron atom giving the bright red appearance. So one molecule of red blood cell can associate with four molecules of oxygen. So remember hemoglobin, it consists of four chains, two alpha, two beta. Each of the chain has a heme, it's iron, iron 2. It comprises of porphyrin ring. And this whole thing, these four chains, when they combine together, they form one hemoglobin. So one one hemoglobin can combine with four molecules of oxygen. So this is just an equation of how it will be. So one molecule of hemoglobin, four molecules of oxygen, when they combine, they form oxyhemoglobin. So hemoglobin is said to show cooperative oxygen binding, which permits rapid binding with oxygen in the lungs. So basically, when the first oxygen molecule binds to the heme group, it will cause a distortion. It will cause a slight change in shape of the hemoglobin. This facilitates the binding of the second and third molecule of oxygen. However, the binding of the fourth molecule of oxygen is slower due to the distorted shape of the molecule. And you can see this later in the graph which will be explained in other videos. So the first part will cause a distortion. Then the second and third oxygen molecule will be easy but the fourth will be a bit harder. Hemoglobin also has a high affinity for oxygen oxygen when the partial pressure of oxygen is high, such as in the lungs. In metabolically active tissue where the partial pressure of oxygen is low, the unstable oxyhemoglobin dissociates and oxygen is liberated to the cell. So in the lungs where the gaseous exchange occur, there is high partial pressure of oxygen. So it's easier for the hemoglobin to combine with oxygen and form oxyhemoglobin. But when it is in parts of the body where the oxygen partial pressure is low, it's easy for for the oxyhemoglobin to release oxygen. So oxyhemoglobin is actually unstable and this is important because we need it for our cellular respiration. The hemoglobin molecule can also carry oxygen and small amounts of carbon dioxide at the same time. So I will explain more about this in the transport of oxygen and also in the transport of carbon dioxide later in this video. The hemoglobin also acts as buffers to maintain the pH value of the blood. This is just a summary of the structure of hemoglobin. So you can go through this a bit with the explanation um, earlier in the video. Moving on is the transport of oxygen in the blood. So when the partial pressure of oxygen is high, the oxygen diffuses out from the alveolar capillary barrier and into the blood plasma. So when the partial pressure of oxygen is high, like in the alveolus in the lungs. So over there, the hemoglobin then combines with four molecules of oxygen to form one molecule of oxyhemoglobin just like in this equation over here so one molecule of hemoglobin combines with four molecules of oxygen to form one oxyhemoglobin okay so the cooperative property explains why hemoglobin can bind rapidly with oxygen molecules and again this is what i mentioned earlier cooperativity if you see the word cooperativity of hemoglobin it's talking about the combination of oxygen molecules with hemoglobin so the first 
first causes a distortion, second and third easier, fourth slightly difficult. So after the four molecules of oxygen combines with the hemoglobin to form one molecule of oxyhemoglobin, in the lungs the blood will be oxygenated, right? After it has been oxygenated, it is transported to the left atrium of the heart and then into the left ventricle and then it is pumped through the systemic circulation to the systemic capillaries found in tissue. So it will pump to the aorta and from the aorta it will branch out into the systemic capillaries in the tissues whereby gaseous exchange occur. So cellular respiration occurs, oxygen will be liberated to the cell to be used for um, their metabolic needs. The partial pressure of oxygen in the actively respiring tissue is lower than the systemic capillaries. So when there is low partial pressure of oxygen, it is easy for the oxyhemoglobin to dissociate and it will liberate four molecules of oxygen and the hemoglobin will be transported back to the lungs. So when there is a drop in partial pressure of oxygen, oxyhemoglobin releases its oxygen, especially in respiring tissues where the partial pressure of oxygen is always lower than that in the blood. So this ensures that the respiring tissues are continuously supplied with oxygen. Moving on is the transport of carbon dioxide in the blood. So carbon dioxide is more soluble in the blood than oxygen and carbon dioxide produced from cellular respiration in cells diffuses into the interstitial fluid and then into the blood capillaries. So there are three ways whereby carbon dioxide can be transported by the blood through to the lungs. First is in the form of bicarbonate, hydrogen carbonate ions, whereby 85% of carbon dioxide are transported this way. Next is carb amino compounds which comprises of about 10% and finally 5%, the remaining 5% can be dissolved in blood plasma. So the first one, majority. 85%. So they are transported in the form of bicarbonate ions. What happens here is the carbon dioxide combines with water first. Okay, look at this equation. The carbon dioxide combines with water first to form carbonic acid. And this is catalyzed by the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. You must remember the enzyme carbonic anhydrase because in other part, the remaining 5% is sort of similar except it does not have the enzyme. Okay, so focus on this first. Carbon dioxide combines with water to form carbonic acid catalyzed by carbonic anhydrase. Then this carbonic acid then dissociates into hydrogen carbonate ions and also hydrogen ions in the presence of the enzyme. The hydrogen carbonate ions then diffuse out of the red blood cells into the plasma because the membrane of the red blood cell is very permeable to hydrogen carbonate ions. So after water combines with carbon dioxide, it forms the carbonic acid and after that it will dissociate into hydrogen carbonate ions and also hydrogen. So now what happens is this hydrogen carbonate ions will move out and after it moves out of the red blood cell these chloride ions will immediately come in they will immediately diffuse into the red blood cells from the plasma and this is important to maintain the electrical neutrality so this process here whereby the hydrogen carbonate ions move out and chloride ions move in that process is called the chloride displacement or the chloride shift so next what happened to the hydrogen carbonate carbonate ions. They are then carried to the lungs where they are converted into carbon dioxide and after they are converted into carbon dioxide, they are expelled into the atmosphere in exhaled air. They are basically breathed out. But remember, we have these hydrogen ions. What happened to them? So the presence of hydrogen ions in the red blood cell decreases its pH because pH basically is associated with the degree of concentration of the hydrogen ions, right? So if there are higher concentration of hydrogen ions, the pH value drops and vice versa. So what happens to the hydrogen ions? These hydrogen ions or protons are then combined with the free hemoglobin to form hemoglobinic acid. This free hydrogen ions again combines with the free hemoglobin because 
oxyhemoglobin has already dissociated into four molecules of oxygen and the hemoglobin and now you have a free hemoglobin so these hydrogen ions combine with the free hemoglobin to form hemoglobinic acid the free hemoglobin acts as a ph buffer which is made available from the forced dissociation of the oxyhemoglobin so this phenomenon is called the bohr shift okay so <laughs> i know that was a mouthful but i've summarized it here and i hope that this will help with your understanding so first what happens and by the way we're talking about the transport of carbon dioxide in the form of bicarbonate ions so first the carbon dioxide combines with water to form carbonic acid and this carbonic acid with the enzyme carbonic and hydrase dissociates into hydrogen carbonate ions and also hydrogen ions now you have this too. These hydrogen carbonate ions will leave the red blood cell. So this one comes out. But then there won't be any um, electrical neutrality. So to maintain the electrical neutrality, what comes out must go in, at least something similar. So when these hydrogen carbonate ions leave the red blood cell, the chloride ions enter the red blood cell and that is called the chloride shift. Now these hydrogen carbonate ions will then travel to the lungs and they will form carbon dioxide again to be breathed out to be exhaled and what happens to this now so the protons the hydrogen ions they obviously will lower the ph of the blood as it keeps increasing so what it does is these hydrogen ions will then combine with the free hemoglobin to form hemoglobinic acid okay so this is the equation and this part here is called the Bohr shift. I know it's really mouthful and really concentrated but take your time, go through again slowly and I hope that this diagram will at least help you with your understanding. Alright, so that was the 85%. How about the other 10%? So the other 10% are transported in the form of carb amino compounds. So for carb amino compounds, it is a reversible reaction whereby the carbon dioxide combines with the amino group of hemoglobin to form carb amino hemoglobin. So this is basically what happens. It combines with the amino group part of the hemoglobin. So then it will form the carb amino hemoglobin ion and what happens after it combines it will then be transported to the lungs and in the lungs it will dissociate back into carbon dioxide and also the hemoglobin again and what happens is this carbon dioxide will be released so the binding of carbon dioxide to hemoglobin lowers its affinity for oxygen forcing the hemoglobin to release its oxygen load and the remaining five percent the remaining five percent the carbon dioxide are just dissolved in the blood Blood plasma so the carbon dioxide dissolves in blood plasma to form carbonic acid just like in the beginning when I talk about the 85% so remember when I said it's very important to stress on the presence of the enzyme carbonic and hydrase over here it's the same thing except without without the enzyme carbonic and hydrase so the carbonic acid ionizes into hydrogen and hydrogen carbonate ions just the same but without the enzyme so the presence of the hydrogen ions oh it's missing a plus here so the presence of the hydrogen ions in the blood plasma increases the acidity and this is quickly buffered by plasma proteins to form proteinic acid just like earlier and these hydrogen carbonate ions are then transported by the blood to the lungs where they associate with hydrogen ions to form carbonic acid which then dissociates to release carbon dioxide to be expelled as exhaled air so it's just the same as the first one but without the enzyme and this is a summary of the three ways of how carbon dioxide is being transported in the blood so the first 85 percent they combine with water with the presence of the carbonic and hydrase enzyme all right chloride shifts occurs and the other 10 percent they combine with the amino group of the hemoglobin and the remaining five percent is just similar to the first part here but without 
the enzyme. So some extra information in the case of carbon monoxide poisoning. So in the case of carbon monoxide poisoning, the carbon monoxide combines more rapidly with hemoglobin than oxygen. Once it combines with hemoglobin, it converts the oxidation state of iron 2 in the hemoglobin to iron 3 to form carboxyhemoglobin. So remember in the beginning when I talked about the structure of hemoglobin, I said that it consists of four chains, two alpha, two beta, and each chain has porphyrin ring and it's iron 2 all right so what happens here is when the carbon monoxide combines with the hemoglobin it changes iron 2 to iron 3 and now when it combines with hemoglobin it forms carboxyhemoglobin the problem is here carboxyhemoglobin does not dissociate just like how oxygen combines with hemoglobin you get oxyhemoglobin but carboxyhemoglobin they don't separate they don't dissociate so less hemoglobin is available to combine with oxygen and a typical case of this you can see um, is when a person perhaps sleeps in the car with the air conditioning being turned on that's why they caution um, it's best not to fall asleep in the car with the air conditioning turned on because the carbon monoxide being produced can actually enter the car and when it does it combines with the hemoglobin so when it combines the carboxyhemoglobin does not dissociate and when they don't dissociate there are less hemoglobin and when there are less hemoglobin meaning less oxygen can combine with them and hence the person eventually you know they basically die in their sleep because lack of oxygen less oxygen to the brain and eventually the brain shuts down and also high altitude at high levels or high altitude basically above sea level like ex extremely high like those who live in the mountains and all the partial pressure of oxygen over there is very low so when a person travels from sea level to high altitude like maybe if you're used to living um, at sea level or not so high you're not a mountain person basically they may be unable to adjust to the low partial pressure of oxygen in the air and may suffer from altitude sickness however after spending several months at high altitude the body will adapt by increasing the production of red blood cells and hemoglobin thus increasing the quantity of oxygen transported by the blood to the cells so basically at first it'll be difficult because um, there's less oxygen over there meaning less oxygen can combine with the hemoglobin Globin. so there's less oxygen for the respiring cells but after spending several months you know the body is capable to adapt it, it's adaptable to change and it will it just takes time so how it will adapt is it will produce more hemoglobin so usually these people they have their red blood cells is basically more concentrated than the average person who lives at sea level or do not live in the mountains all right so if you've reached this point thank you very much hit the like button if you found it helpful as it does help in reaching out to others as well do support my channel by pressing the subscribe button so i will know and it gives me motivation to continue producing content like this in the future and finally share this video to those who might find this helpful see you in the next one